collect ideas, not beliefs. If you collect ideas, right, it means that you're like, oh, that's interesting, and then that's interesting, and then this is interesting, and then that's also interesting. And some of these contradict each other, but it's okay, because I don't have to believe any of them. I can just entertain their feasibility and find them interesting, so I can collect all these different ideas. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness. We've got the legendary Jason Silva in the house. My man. What's up, bro? Excited. It's a good pop. It's going to be a great yeah. interview. Three-year anniversary of you coming on the first time. Can you believe it? It's been crazy, man. You've grown a lot. We've grown a lot. You've grown a lot. It's been so much fun, man. Amazing to see you, man. It's amazing what happens when you just show up every week for six years in anything you do. That's right, man. And if you do what you love, it never really feels like work, right? Yeah. You get caught up in something. It feels like a mission. It feels like a vocation. When so. we started this... Yeah podcast I remember saying I was in a transition in my life I was trying to figure out what's the feeling I want to create in my life moving forward I built yeah. and sold a company for seven figures that was fun but it wasn't fulfilling yeah it was like cool we're making some impact mm. making some money mm. and like my bank account is full but is my heart full mm. and I remember asking myself the question what do I want to do that even if I never got paid I would love to do mm -hmm. And sitting down with brilliant people and asking questions yeah. became like my answer when I asked myself that. Sure. And you know what that reminds me of, actually, um, not to not yeah, to interrupt ahead. you, but but you just sparked this 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 realization. There's an organization called the Edge Foundation, Edge.org, and they basically gather brilliant people to write these amazing essays um, that answer big questions about the human condition. But it's really their log line that I find very inspiring, and I think it very much applies to what you've done with School of Greatness and in many ways the way I try to curate my own life. It goes like this. Um, I think it'll set us up for our conversation yeah. too. To arrive at the edge of the world's knowledge. To gather the world's most interesting minds. To put them together in a room and to have them ask each other the questions they've been asking themselves. Wow. That's what I do. Right. That is what you do. That's my life. And isn't that beautifully put though? There's this, just this notion of like curating these people who whose lives inspire you, who have done things in the world that resonate with you, that, that give you goosebumps. And then to be in front of them and to have them, right, to have us ask each other the questions that we've been asking ourselves. Powerful. Which is like, I think the essence of a true conversation is you sit down and you say, so what have you been asking yourself lately? Mm -hmm. Like, what's keeping you up at night, you know? What have you been asking yourself lately? Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say, let's see. I'm in my I'm in my mid thirties now. Me too. Thirty six, just turned. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just I just turned thirty seven. I'm eighty two. Born in eighty three, baby. Okay. Nice. March, baby. Nice. February. Pisces. Aquarius. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. I don't know what that Not means. Not either. But, 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 but my girlfriend knows what it means. She always like reads yeah. my stuff. Yeah. So you're thirty seven. What What's the question you've been asking yourself? Yeah. So I guess the question is kind of cliche, but it's but it's the question we, I think it's. The human condition is defined by it, which is, you know, what are we meant to do with ourselves um, in response to our unique situation? And our uh -huh. unique situation is characterized by this expanded awareness, this amount of self-consciousness that we have, that we can think about our own thinking and that we can contemplate the, the infinite, right? That, that human beings are immensely talented, creative but also very agitated beings. Yes. You know, in, in, in some ways, yeah, we can, we can build space telescopes and we can marvel at the cosmos and we can contemplate space and time on a scale just shy of the infinite, right? We can imagine the Big Bang. We can try to imagine what came before the Big Bang. All these things that exceed our boundedness and yet simultaneously we feel very finite and we feel very contained by our mortal bodies, our heart pumping, breath gasping, decaying bodies. For me, I am still trying to make sense uh, of, of our situation or, or rather find some, some way to absolve our situation. And, and I don't know if we talked about this three years ago, but this is, this is a book you'll probably start turning to more and more as the years uh, keep passing by. It's a book called The, the, the Denial of Death. By, huh. by Ernest Becker. But the key idea is that we have, you know, man has an inner symbolic life, an interiority. 
And that signifies a certain kind of freedom, because we can imagine impossibly large things with this interior symbolic life. Our interior symbolic life can fit mythologies that are this big, mm -hmm. right? Like every story, right, that's ever been told that's bigger than us. It's all Joseph Campbell's monomyth. Yeah. And we can entertain these vastnesses within us, right? So our inner symbolic self symbolizes or signifies a certain kind of freedom. And yet we also are aware that we have a bounded, finite physical body, which puts a limit on that freedom. Yeah. Makes so, ur urgency. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like whew, this, this feeling of bounded possibility, infinite potential that we feel we have that is curtailed only by the notion that the clock is ticking. ticking. And we're going to die. Okay. It's so sad. Well, it, it is. It, I think it's very, it's very how, depressing. How and do you, we you know, you know, life? Exactly. Well, how do we extend life? And I feel how? like we're 100 years away. Like we were born just 100 years shy of yeah. actually really learning how to extend it like an extra 100 years. Well, that's no doubt. I mean, we've already doubled the human lifespan. So like the progress has been astonishing from, you know, the rise of antibiotics, modern medicine. I mean, we've already made the average lifespan, I think, be over 70. Crazy. Um, what we need to reach is something called escape velocity, where we'll be adding a year of life expectancy for every year that passes. <laughs> And so when you get to that point, escaping it, yeah, yeah, dude, and, and, and there's no doubt that that's where we're heading. I mean, the advances happening in sort of genetics and bi biotechnology it? will allow us to increasingly master the language of biology. Have right? we missed the mark, though? Have, have we? The, have we missed the time? Well, that's the, the big question mark is whether some of these, uh, I guess, breakthroughs in, in our scientific understanding and capacity to manipulate biology will uh, sort of fully flower and, and sort of emerge into the That's commercial right, application yeah. in time for us to benefit from those things. But until that happens, all we can do is make sure that we commit ourselves to something every day that allows us um, freedom from self-consciousness. So mm. something that's so, that feels so important and that, that, that we feel so committed to here and now and every day that we get out of bed in the morning feeling like like we're slaying the dragon, so right, to speak. Right, right. And, and, and we have no choice, especially in the Western world, right? It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it's like, if you can feed yourself and if you can pay your rent, all of a sudden basic sustenance is not the meaning of life anymore. The meaning of life becomes one of... Finding the meaning of life. Well, exactly. Figuring out the purpose of the game becomes the purpose of the game, yeah, yeah. you know? Your yeah. meaning of life, yeah. That's right, you know? And, and I ask myself, I'm like, I remember when I graduated college, I double majored in film and philosophy, and my, my romantic fantasies were to be kind of like a flaneur. I don't know if you've ever heard this term. <laughs> so the flaneur is the walking philosopher. And, and I'm not sure who came up with the term, but it was used to describe a lot of these, I think it was like Paris in the 20s when all these yeah, artists yeah. would hang out in cafes in Paris and they, everybody was a painter or a musician or a filmmaker. And all they were doing was just like, contemplating what it means to be a person and making art about it. Like, what a gift, you know? Um, <laughs> You're doing that now. Well, that was, that was my fantasy graduating college. I just want to travel the world with my video camera and I want to like think out loud. I want to reflect. I want to be like a writer, but with video. Mm -hmm. you know, I want to be like a poet, but with video. Um, and then I got caught up in the trappings of becoming successful and I got my first gig with current TV, Al Gore's TV network as a television presenter and I moved to LA yeah. and I went to parties and I got an agent and I got a publicist and I was like, how do I expand my micro fame to create new opportunities, you know, and, and, and grow, right? Yes. Financially and in terms of my capacity to make a, social a dent with my work. Yeah, social influence, social proof, all those, all those trappings, so <laughs> to speak. Um, and, and, then, and then, you know, in 2011, Brain Games, like, Blew yeah, up in blew a massive up. way. It's still me. everywhere right now. Yeah, it's still on Netflix. Like it's still people it's still, still watch airlines, the show. Yeah, 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 it's crazy. That that's a that's like my version of Saved by the Bell. You know, <laughs> I'll always be associated with with brain games. But so that you know, but that was also like oh, you know, whoa, Hollywood, L.A., like billboards, like that whole thing for a little while. I did that for five seasons, and uh -huh. then I did that other show, Origins, and all of those were wonderful things. I'm, I'm proud to be associated with I think content that makes people think about yeah. their their cognition, their brain, the way they perceive and misperceive reality. But the larger questions of what to do with our brains, what to do with our perceptions and our misperceptions is something that still agitates me. And so being on the other side of like 
a massively successful TV show and essentially tasting the thing that we supposedly associate with completion and finality, like you've made it. How do they Um, make you feel? Well, it has only made me realize that that is not all there is, you know, Mm -hmm. and that... It's kind of like the Jim Carrey quote. Have you heard of Jim Carrey's quote where he's like, I "I wish everyone becomes rich and famous so that they realize... (laughs) It's not the key, you know, the key is not becoming rich. Happiness yeah. doesn't come from that. 100%. And I mm-hmm. think the, the only aspect where I think it makes sense to want to have some kind of financial success is so that you, you don't have to be burdened by those lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy yeah. of needs. Like, it sucks to have to stress about rent. It sucks to have to struggle to pay the bills. And way too many people are dealing with those struggles. And that's mm-hmm. the problem. And, and I think that's one of the reasons that I'm so attracted to Scandinavian countries or places like the Netherlands. They're much more egalitarian. People have a much better quality of life. Yeah, they, they tax you more, but you also have free education and free health care while still having a dynamic and creative economy. And the people there report higher life satisfaction yeah. than many other countries across Happier, the world. These are the happiest longer. countries in the world, whether it's you know Denmark or the Netherlands. Um, so there are ways, I think, of organizing our society so that people spend less time struggling economically and more time having free time yeah. for leisure and or personal development and or creativity. But I think that we make a mistake in thinking that once we create a society that is like that, that then it will be done. Yeah. Because then new questions uh, sort of are emerge from within that we are compelled to try right. to answer, which is, okay, well, I can pay the rent and, and I've got a Everything's home taken care of. And everything is fine. And yet the clock is ticking. I'm going to die. Nothing lasts, you know, even the feeling of satisfaction that you got from that moment of success where you finally over, overcame those hurdles. It's gone. Yeah. And so then what? And then, and then the, big, the big questions from the college dorms when you were stoned, like, come back. <laughs> What's the meaning of life? Why are we here? What do we do in the face of death? What happens when our loved ones get sick or our parents get old? And, and I think that trying to answer that continues to fuel a lot of the the work that I do with my with my digital content, which which yeah. you've seen some of it. It's amazing. What do you think is the question that over the last four thousand plus years is the most common question asked that we've never been able to answer? The one that haunts us all. Is it why are we here? Is it what's the meaning of life? I think it's what happens after we die. Oh. <laughs> I think that's the one that human beings are trying to make sense of, you know, and I think that there's poetry in in certain answers to that question such as you know energy cannot be destroyed it can only be transformed and so on and so yeah. forth and, and i get very little um yeah when the brain is dying. i get very little reassurance <laughs> from, from from that idea i think what frightens me is the idea that there is nothing else which again doesn't get rid of the mystery of why we're here to begin with because the the richness of our interior experience our capacity to express our interiority in the form of song and poetry right and art i mean when i when i behold a beautiful piece of art when i listen to a beautiful melody you know i I become the melody i become the artist i share the subjective experience of that soul that 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 somehow concocted or architected that piece of art and so i feel like there's something within us that feels divine that is divine you know jordan peterson famously says uh he talks about that example of why you need art in your life and he's talking about people at like a museum like staring at like renaissance paintings and he's like why are they staring at that they don't understand what that is they didn't study art history necessarily why are they gawking at that painting and then he says well the reason the reason that they sorry i think i have a hair in my face Um, he says the reason that people are staring or are gawking at this painting is because implicitly they recognize that something transcendent shines through the frame you know so they they may not know what they're looking at but they know that what they're looking at is divine in some some way Mm. or some you know it's it's very similar to have you heard of the phrase stendhal syndrome no so stendhal syndrome is is basically what happens when an aesthetic experience a spiritual experience is so overwhelming to the senses that you can collapse and have like heart palpitations. Wow. And this will happen to like really religious people when they go in to the like, church or something yeah, like the Sistine Chapel in, in Rome or whatever. And, and they they're faint or yeah, Jerusalem. That's right. Yeah, that's Jesus, right. They've yeah. been praying and thinking about this their whole time. And then finally they see that statue or that painting and they collapse. The emotional but they collapse from, from ecstasy. They collapse right. from beauty. 
You know, so if, if there's something that's going to like knock you over the face and throw you to the floor, it's better for it to be because of beauty than because you're getting a stroke or a heart attack. You right, know what I'm right. saying? But um, what's but what, yeah, but the, 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 but back to the, the thing about Jordan Peterson, it's like we don't have to necessarily understand art, know that it hints at an unseen realm of the human heart, and I don't know if that means that we survive past our death, but I know that it makes me want us to, you know, like yeah. when I look even at, at the cosmos at night sometimes, especially from a place with no light pollution, you know, I can't help but get caught up in like wanting to know, you know, if, is there some kind of unseen order here? And I don't know if it looks like a god with a beard, but is there something, man? Like, is there an explanation? Is yeah. there an equation? Is there a design behind? Is there a designer behind the design? And and granted, you know, scientists tell us no, but but something in the human heart, I think, finds it difficult to recoil with the idea that there is nothing. Because if there is nothing, then why the fuck are we here crying with the question, <laughs> yearning for there to be something, you know? Yeah. And, and I can't, I just, it, I'm not, oh, there we go. That's the hair. What do you think is the, the biggest fear then for most people? Is it that none of this is going to matter because I don't know what's happening after I'm gone and, I, and it might... Well, I think, I think the fear is uncertainty. Um, I, think, I think that's the reason why there is a billion dollar industry now teaching people how to become more present and and the irony is is um if we would have been able to live in the present a hundred thousand years ago in the savannas of africa we would have gotten eaten by the lion that we didn't see coming right so like le living in the present is not evolutionarily advantageous you know what's advantageous is the fact that we can imagine future scenarios and the reason we have memory, and Jordan Peterson talks about this, is not so we can relish about past times, is so that we can learn from things that happened in the past and make inferences about what's going to happen in the future. Not get eaten. Right. When, when you watch your friend get eaten. Alive. Correct. Correct. So then what happens is mitigating against future risk was biologically selected for. Wow. Those who did that bred more widely. Mm -hmm. And so we have inherited that brilliant neuroses of foreshadowing future danger and mitigating against it. Yeah. The problem is once we've made the world safe, we still are like a hamster in a hamster wheel or like a dog humping another dog in heat and then you like pull the female away and the male <laughs> is still humping with his like right. penis in the air, you know? Like that's us. It's like you may have money, you may be paying your rent, you maybe have a wife and a kid and this and that, but you're still worried about tomorrow. Like what's gonna happen? Oh my God, what, why? The, the collapse of the government, a terrorist attack, an airplane disaster, like we, 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 that's the wiring. And so ironically, we've gotten to a time where now some of the hardware that has served us so well is now problematic and there's this desire to return to a kind of capacity to be here now and actually like neuter our foreshadowing capacity and our mm. and our and a relishing of memory Interesting. to block the signals forwards and backwards in fact in mental health now there is a a renaissance again i'm talking about like the rise of learning to be in the present meditation mindfulness yeah. all of these techniques are teaching us to neutralize our wiring to think about the future. Yeah. Michael Pollan's new book, How to Change Your Mind, the best-selling book that just was written about I psychedelics. Read it. I want to see this. Yeah. Wonderful book, and you should definitely have yeah. Michael Pollan. Um, so in the in the first few pages of the book, he describes our modern malaise. He basically says that um, human the human brain, human beings are like an artificial intelligence program. We take in data from the present, we compare that data with data from the past, mm -hmm. and we use that then to make predictions about the future. Wow. And that's what we're always doing automatically all the time. In fact, a lot of the time, we dispense with the present data altogether and just leapfrog to the conclusion. And so we're living in this perpetual been there's and seen that's of the adult mind, also known as jadedness. Like you show up in a restaurant, <laughs> you're not even excited about what you're going to eat. Ah, I've already had a burger before. I know what this is. I know what that is. So you're just, you're not even there. You're like, rather look at your phone or you're rather, what movie are we going to watch later? Like you're, we're just never present we've, because we've, lived, we've leapfrogged to the conclusion because our brain is so effective at saying, I know what this is and making predictions about the future. And if the future's not dangerous, then we don't even have to pay attention to what's happening right now. So we live with this kind of perpetual low-level hum 
of anxiety. This future tense, like we're like crooked, like having a crooked back. We're like future tense all the time. Never now, always future tense, you know. And maybe that makes you a good businessman or a good planner. Right. But unless you're like an architect and you're like planning the structure you're going to build, like the incapacity to enjoy and smell the flowers is very problematic and is, and is sort of one of the main features of mental distress. So then he says, well, what are some of the solutions? Um, what, are, what are some of the ways that we can neuter our compulsion to constantly right. leapfrog to the future and leave the present? Travel. Novelty. Why travel? So travel is something new. Yeah. Experiencing yes. something new for yes. the first time. Correct. Not like I've had the same pizza every That's day. Right. That's right. I go to the same restaurants every week. That's I'm right. I go on the same date night every, you know. That's right. Experiences that violate your expectations. Interesting. So that's another thing that is good to keep in mind. So wow. travel, art, certain kinds of drugs, like cannabis is very effective for this. Um, what these things do is they block all signals forwards and backwards automatically. It's hard to know what's about to happen if you're in a place that's completely new. When you're off the reservation, you don't know where that path leads. And when you don't know where that path leads, it's hard to imagine where it leads. So instead, your senses are heightened and you're here now paying attention to see where it's going to take yes. you. Living in shock and awe. It's a little, exactly. It's that's like right. living in the wonder. Yes. And that's why I think being a, a child that's who's right. always curious 100%. is the way to feel fulfilled and happiness and joy because you're just like, Always in the wonder of what 100%. is happening. Why is this happening? That's 100%. This is beautiful. 100%. 100%. And, and, it, and it also answers this, this dilemma of our existential conundrum of what to do about death. Because it's not even that we're afraid of dying tomorrow. We're afraid of dying in 30 years. Like, I'm afraid of turning 90 and dying when I'm 90. That wow. already haunts my yeah, dreams. Exactly. Except when I'm traveling, when I'm exposed to great beautiful art, when I'm making love, or when, when you're I'm high flow. on cannabis, or, or when, when I'm flow. flow. What happens is you block all signals forwards and backwards. When you block all signals forwards and backwards, you enter the flow of the present, in the words of Michael Pollan, a present that is literally wonder-full. Wonder-full. And then he goes on. Wonder being the byproduct of exactly unencumbered sense of first sight or virginal noticing interesting right to which the adult <laughs> brain has closed itself wow so you're obliterating the adult capacity to foreshadow everything and you're returning to a more virginal state of heightened appreciation for what's unfolding in real time and that wow. seems to be the answer to our ills because when we have those experiences, we have awe. And awe is an experience of such perceptual expansion in the moment that all your mental models about what this is are fucking obliterated. And when they're obliterated, you have to make room for new assimilation. Wow. New assimilation means, oh, now I know what a glacier looks like. Or, <laughs> oh, that's what a lion looks like in its right. natural habitat. Like you are, you are dumbstruck. You are awestruck. And it turns out that even though these are transitory experiences, they leave afterglows. That's why when people take magic mushrooms and have a mystical experience or when they go to the Grand Canyon or they see their child be born, they're left with this afterglow for weeks, months, sometimes even years afterwards of increased well-being, increased uh, creativity and uh, increased compassion for other people. Mm. So perhaps, you know, I'm answering my own question here, but perhaps the, the answer to the existential agitation of what to do with ourselves in the face of death is simply to stop and smell the roses, to learn to steward the contents of consciousness to the here and now, yeah. to hack ourselves by learning to block all signals forwards and backwards, by exposing ourselves to great art, to travel, to do things new and different, uh -huh. and to not get caught up in routine or patterns of thinking. Because too many patterns in our thinking, when we become like excessively, um, when we get caught up in like the excessive rumination and overthinking That's and self-consciousness that characterizes depression and anxiety, what we need is to shake the fucking snow globe. Mm -hmm. To shake the snow globe. And so what shakes the snow globe? Well put you on a plane right now and drop you off in Botswana, you know, on the back <laughs> yeah. of a safari truck, like listening to the Inception score. And it's just like, I love that like, score. before you know, me too, it's before amazing. you know it, you're hurled back into the flow of it's, the now. It's interesting you say this because yeah. it is a paradox because yeah. we need routines and rituals 
to create productiveness in our lives. If you're always doing something new, then you're eating the foods maybe that aren't healthy for you that's gonna make you stronger and <laughs> healthier. Right. You're not ever doing something consistent that's gonna that's help right. build your business or a that's relationship right. forward because you're traveling and you're never there, whatever it may be. So there's a paradox of routines and rituals <clears throat> every morning, day and night, but also the newness of life that brings you joy and wonder, fullness. Beautiful. So you've got to constantly dance yeah, yeah. with this. Learning thing. to oscillate with that is, is so. It's the when dance. you so it's like okay, ritual and routine for six weeks, but then when you feel a little itchy and scratchy, it's like do something unexpected, or every night do something unexpected. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's a little bit of every day you can have a ritual routine mm -hmm. where you know you're going to get a workout in, mm -hmm. you're going to take care of your health, but you're going to do something that scares you. That's beautifully put, and and. I feel like I keep coming back to Jordan Peterson because I find he's him great. So brilliant. We had him on twice. Yeah, he was yeah. great. Oh, beautiful twice. Um, like twenty four million views on he, a video we did with him. It went viral. Wow, it's crazy. Whoa. That was brilliant. Yeah, he is brilliant. One of the things that I also love is he's saying that um, you have to do things to take care of yourself today, but you also have to take into account the well being of your future self, because your future self is going to be you very soon. The decisions you make today will affect your yeah. future self. So can you? <clears throat> so when he actually this was one of his best videos. So he was like, what to do, how to deal with an existential crisis is, well, first of all, like find a, a, a passion or an orientation that takes care of you today, that satiates your itch today, but that also um, doesn't alienate the people that you love that are around you. Right. You have to take into account something that, that, that gets you off, but that also Without doesn't hurting alienate, everyone. yeah, that doesn't hurt other people, right? You have to take other people into account, but you know who you also have to take into account is your future self. So if like if like the answer to all your problems today is to do heroin and smoke cigarettes, it's that's not, not a favor to your future self. So that's not going to work, and it's also going right, to make right. your friends and family worry about you. But perhaps the answer to your problems today is to, you know, learn to work abroad. You know, figure out a situation where you can work remotely. Um, develop a routine where in the mornings you work out, you drink coffee, and you do your work for four or five hours. And then every afternoon you commit to doing a different hike or to doing a different kind of hobby. So you're kind of ticking all those boxes mm -hmm. of satiating your need for novelty and adventure and enthrallment while being responsible and meeting the criteria of taking care of your future self and taking care of yourself. Um, and if you can, I guess, if you can manage all of those things, if you have the capacity for discipline and for surrender. Actually, you see me wearing a, a Venn diagram here. Um, Something, I, I, nothing, and mystery. Yeah, there. yeah. So I have a, a very similar one. Instead, it goes uh, discipline, surrender, and they overlap and flow. Ooh. And so flow, for me, then, is that towing the line between chaos and order. You know, because order mm -hmm. is discipline. Yeah. Chaos is surrender. Flow is where they overlap. Flow is towing that line. What do artists do? Artists flirt it's with chaos, flirt with the unknown, yeah, yeah. right? They contend with the unknown, but what do they do? But with they, the structure and a framework. That's right. They bound it. They, they bring it back into tangible form. They articulate it. They make sense of it. They summon coherence, you know? And I think that's, that's something that we can sort of apply to our lives because we, we need that balance. It's kind of cliche to say that, but... There's a guy called Robin Carthart Harris in the Imperial College of London who's been doing some studies on how psychedelics tend to alleviate uh, anxiety and depression that has not responded to conventional medications. And he came up with a theory to account for why they are so effective at doing this. And it's called the entropic brain theory. But basically the idea is that the brain has a certain kind of order and coherence. And it turns out that either through trauma or things that have happened in your past that have jolted your nervous system in a way that it has caused like a permanent agitation yeah. can lead to the symptoms of either PTSD or anxiety and depression. All of those are directly in response to a brain that has gone hypervigilant or an ego that has gone hypervigilant because it has experienced this threat. You know, this feeling of potentially being obliterated mm -hmm. by being attacked, by having trauma. So by it's having... always on guard. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Fight or flight. Always all the time. stressed. Always. Yes. Yeah. Always stressed. And, and so basically when they did fMRI scans on the brain of these people that suffer from these diseases, they found that the default mode network, which is the part of the brain that sort of governs self-awareness, what they call the, the ego construct, 
has become a tyrant is a great metaphor to describe yeah. it. So the ego is necessary. I mean, the ego gets the book written. The ego gets you out of bed in the morning. The ego makes you go to work. I mean, we need some ego in our lives. But when the ego metastasizes into a despot, into an authoritarian, it's no longer like an elected president, but a dictator. <laughs> and it's super paranoid that everybody's against it. That, 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 that the brain essentially has become too ordered. And those are the diseases of depression and anxiety and excessive rumination and looping thoughts and obsessive thinking and OCD and all that stuff. Too much order. Yeah. Right? But again, on the other extreme is too much chaos. Those are the diseases too of much psychosis. Freedom. Well, psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Yeah. That's a brain that's completely lost touch with any kind of tetherings. You don't want that either. But what seems to happen with psychedelics is that it takes brains that are too ordered and shakes the snow globe. And it's like a reset that doesn't necessarily send them all the way to chaos, but introduces a little bit of chaos in a brain that's too ordered to get it back to center. Back to, again, balance. Back mm -hmm. to towing the line between chaos and order. Back to, like, flow between discipline and surrender. Wow. There's too much discipline, you're a martyr. You're a slave, right? Yeah. And too much disorder, well, you're like a crazy hippie artist yeah, yeah. living on the street who can't monetize to save his life, and, like, he's got to get his shit together, right? Because mm -hmm. that's also important. So can you have both, right? Can you be a creative and a neurotic? Can you be free and disciplined? It's kind of like Steve Jobs, you know? He was kind of the both. That's and right. he built one of the most you know, influential That's brands right. of our generation, That's if you, right. you know, arguably. That's and he right. was, maybe he was a little too chaotic at yeah. times. Oh, yeah. But he was able to be smart enough to have a team mm -hmm. and structure mm -hmm. to like, where he could push the boundaries yeah. all the time of crazy, chaotic yeah. thinking and That's right. demands, uh, creative demands, but also yeah. to bring let's monetize together. it too. Yeah, he was brilliant. And, and he always talked about, I think, the importance of being like a polymath. Right, he when he was in college, he like took a class that was like a calligraphy yeah, class or whatever, and all yeah, this yeah. stuff. Yeah, like so, be interested in a lot of different Everything. things. Be like a poly so jack of all trades. Yeah, pursue. master of none. Yeah, exactly. it's kind of been my life. I was I call myself a decathlete of life. That's I actually beautiful. did the decathlon in college. Okay, and because I was never, I was like, I'm never going to be an all American or reach the top uh -huh. of any one event. Uh -huh. I just wasn't talented enough. Mm -hmm. I didn't have the gift of like speciality. Mm -hmm to be great at one thing. Yeah. I wasn't fast enough to win the 100. I wasn't good enough as like right. a distance. I right. wasn't strong enough to throw the shot pit. But if you put 10 of the events together, I could kind of get really dangerous at all 10 to where I could be good at 10 things as one. And that's kind of been my life. It's like, oh, I'm not really that brilliant at any one thing. Yeah, yeah. But you kind of try a lot of different things. Yeah. It's what uh, Robert Greene talks about, the great author of uh, the, you know, 48 Laws of Power, mm -hmm. Law of Attraction and Mastery, mm -hmm. he said his life was, he was really good at a lots of different writing styles, but he was never great at script writing. He was mm -hmm. never great at novels. He was mm -hmm. never great at copywriting mm -hmm. or advertising writing, mm -hmm. but he tried them all mm -hmm. until he found like this uniqueness of these types of books that mm -hmm. kind of encompassed all of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that made it great. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I'm curious about your fears in the last seven years, in your 30s. Mm. You've had great, it's probably like all your training of your life has culminated to be successful in your 30s of reaching the heights in TV and billboards and all these other things you've done, social media following. It's all happened in the last seven, eight plus mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. While you've achieved probably the greatest you know, social successes of your life in the last eight years, what's been the biggest fear you've faced during all of it at the same time? What's been the biggest emotional stress at the same time as the highest success? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it just, it just goes back to kind of struggling with enjoying the moment as it's unfolding. That's been your challenge? Yeah, man, because I, I guess uh, the same discipline with which I plotted course and the, the, the work ethic the, and planning for tomorrow and looking out for my future self, that also can metastasize into an inability to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Because you're always thinking of the next, I've got yeah. to get bigger, I've got to create a yeah. bigger video. Or That's right. The more project. distance between me and my last like cathartic piece of work there is, the less I can receive a compliment. So really? Like, let's say like so you I need was, to come out with something next week. And yeah. Next so like if I was I was in Tulum like two weeks ago and I had a, I took my, my my sort of 
partner in crime for a lot of this video content. Relationship a partner or a business no, partner? No, wonderful DP. Like yeah, yeah. He's a director of photography and we make we make art together basically. We, we just dance and, I, and and my videos are profound reflections of, of, of poetic reverie. Like your imagination. I, I get, I'm out of my head. When I make my content, like what, what you're getting is pure I'm like a I'm like a vessel, yeah. yeah. I mean, I never script my stuff, and I think I, when I get in those flows, I mean, you know those. They're flows. unbelievable, yeah. Yeah, and so, thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so when I'm fresh from those spaces, like when I when I make time for it, when I can go there, and when something comes through, right? Um, it's like that Khalil Gibran quote: "It comes through you, but not from you, and though it is with you, it belongs yeah. not to you." But like, at least <laughs> I can come out of that experience and be like, okay, I feel. Absolved. I, I feel did something expunged. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and also it's it's cathartic because I, I I contended with the unknown and I brought something wonderfully coherent to share with the world. Uh-huh. You know, and chaos and order, order. beautiful. Yeah. Yes, it's art. Yeah. Ballet, like full yeah, on. Yeah. And and then for like the next week or two, I'm like in this natural blissed out high. I'm like sleeping in. I'm like it's enjoying incredible. food. I'm like I'm smelling the roses. Every like, kiss is like this. Everything beautiful is awesome. Yeah. And then when I receive you know, not not that one needs to depend positive on that, feedback. Feed, positive feedback, validation. Uh, walking down, I love your work. I love your videos. You know, something that you probably get all the time as well. When I'm fresh, fresh from a shoot, I can receive that because I feel connected to the person that produced that work. Yeah, that that's me. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm fulfilled, and you're fulfilled from it. Great. But if it's been a couple of weeks that I haven't gone there. And then all my neurosis starts coming back and all that restlessness starts coming back and all that second guessing and all that self doubt and all that what's it all about, you know, all the lessons that I learned in my last video that I then developed amnesia for (laughs) a couple weeks later. Or the videos from a year ago. That's right. Then when I get stopped and somebody's like, I love your work, then I kind of recoil like a nervous artist. I'm I, you know nobody. What I, feel I haven't like? done anything lately. That's right. I feel like one of those, you know, have you ever heard those best selling authors that have written one book and they like, you know, they, they struggled and the self-loathing and the doubt and the, the, the gnawing writer's block and then finally they write something and it becomes a huge hit. And then like, finally, they're getting all the validation they wanted and then they're at, they're, they're at like a book reading and a fan comes up and they're like, what are you working on next? And nothing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, Ah, I feel like an imposter. How am I supposed to like deliver or outdo what I've already done? Yeah. And that feeling emerges when when there's too much temporal distance between mm. me and my last work. So, how do you think we eliminate self doubt? <sighs> well, I think I think I think I think I don't know if we if we eliminate it. I think that we develop a different relationship uh-huh. with it because again. Um, I mean, we should feel privileged to have one great idea in our lives. It's true. I mean, we've we've all just we've already won the lottery, right? The sperm that yeah. reached your mother's egg, the fact that you didn't have any congenital diseases, yeah. that you didn't die in a car accident, that you have the privilege to be shooting this podcast right now on a weekday, talking to your friend, asking right. him questions you've been About asking life. yourself. <laughs> like we've already we've already won the lottery in so many ways. But like, why do so, we doubt ourselves? Well, I think it's because when you're doing what you love, that fills your your holes. You know that makes you feel whole. Um, and then when what you love impacts the world, that also makes you feel whole. But everything is a transitory moment. So yesterday I was doing what I loved, and then yesterday I got validation for it. But then, what have I done today? Like what have every you done day for me is lately? a new day. Yeah, yeah. Like I I don't know that I can ever rest on my laurels in any way that, that I would be being honest with myself. Like if I was to come in here and be like, oh yeah, yeah, everything's great because of everything I've achieved. That's bullshit. Five years ago. Yeah, yeah. that's bullshit. Like everything's not great because of what we've achieved. Like if we can't make every day significant, you know, then the day is wasted. The years mm. shall run like rabbits. You know, I don't know if you ever saw that Richard Linklater movie Before Sunset. No, but it's 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 a movie about two people who meet on a train in Europe and spend the day together and fall in love. And the whole time they're together, they're talking about how fleeting this moment is. It's gone and next. That's right. Soon, so soon. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to end. How do you hold on to? How it? do you? Well, you can't. How do you, you struggle? Extend. That's right. The moment. That's right. This is this is the story of my life. And and <laughs> and at the end of the film, at the end of the film, it's it's dawn. 
and he recites a poem by W.H. Auden, and it goes, and all the clocks in the city began to whir and chime, oh, let not time deceive you, you cannot conquer time, and headaches and in worries vaguely life leaks away, and time will have its fancy tomorrow or today. And oh so, my gosh. And so it's like, I think for me, it's like, well, yesterday I was able to evoke a poetic reverie. I was able to create something beautiful. I was able to get off on the beauty that I was mm -hmm. creating. And I was able to hopefully touch someone else and make their life a little bit better. So that ticked all the boxes. I had ecstasis, I had catharsis, and then I had yeah. the feeling of communion with yeah. others who were affected by my work. That filled me to the brim. But something that Jamie Wheel from Flow Genome Project says is that our self system are fundamentally like leaky buckets. We're colanders. So we can keep filling that, that leaky bucket with like the art we do, the people we love, the things we create in the world. Like we fill that bucket with, with purpose every single day. But then we go to sleep and then a few days later it's just leaking from the, from the bottom. So we can, never, we can never trap the, the bucket? Not fill the holes? Yeah. Well, I think, I think masters are people that are able to upgrade their self systems from leaky buckets. The way they think? As, G, as the way they think, maybe through meditation, maybe through transcendence, maybe through techniques of ecstasy that I certainly am not an expert in yet. But the key thing that, that Jamie Wheel says, if we could change our self systems from leaky buckets, from colanders, into, into chalices, then not only could we render ourselves whole, but we could render ourselves holy. Mm. You know, he says, instead of uh, getting hooked on the state, on the high, what about like raising the stage altogether? And how do we do that? Well, no doubt techniques like meditation and mindfulness. I think the psychedelic psychotherapy stuff. I think creating art that shifts our mind state. Events like Burning Man tend to give people a different perspective and a high that lasts for six months after the event. You yeah. know, just knowing that human beings are capable of creating something so magnificent together just uplifts the human spirit. and makes you feel fundamentally less isolated yeah, and yeah. more connected to fellow man. And it's like, well, we may be mortal beings, but we are mortal beings that can make music that will <laughs> melt the stars. Right, right, right. You know, and that's our responsibility. Um, <laughs> and, if someone uh, came to you and said, I'm just constantly doubting myself. Yeah. Uh, I've gone after everything in my life and I've achieved so many great things, my relationships, my career, my business, whatever, like I always achieve it, but I never feel enough. Someone who's achieving everything, but it's like, oh, I just sold this hundred million dollar company, but now what do I do? I have to start something new. How do I eliminate this self-doubt to the person who is like, I have no clue what to do with my life, why I'm here. I have no talents, no skills. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt myself mm -hmm. every moment. To either one of them, how would yeah. you say is the best way to overcome self-doubt? You know what I think one of the best ways to crack ourselves open from the curse of self-obsession is uh, that South African saying, Ubuntu, Matata. Ubuntu. <laughs> Ubuntu. The yeah, one yeah. says, I am because you are. Uh -huh, it's great. I find that moments of like radical and sudden empathy or radical and sudden compassion immediately dissipate all those gnawing thoughts of like self-doubt and self-loathing and self-pity and, and just desire. They're obliterated by this immediate communion with another being. Um, and I know that they call that the helper's high actually. Mm -hmm. um, people, being of who service. Work, people who work in volunteerism or of service, especially when it's the kind of service that you have direct encounter with the people, people. you're helping. You so see it's not the just, transformation. That's right. So it's not just like in your, Writing a in check. your beautiful office. Yeah, yeah, I mean that might help for like a sound like, yeah, but like it's it's when you see the people that you affect. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I can look at the view counts on my videos and be like, oh, it's cool, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being successful and I'm affecting people, but it's really, I, I feel better from one person yeah. who I have a five minute conversation with on the street who, who tells me that, 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 that they're, they were depressed and then they saw something I did, you know. And what happens in the helper's eyes, actually it's not even that you have time to think about, oh my God, I feel so much better, my ego. No, 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 it's actually the compassion that you feel for a person suffering and some part of you that realizes that you were able to alleviate that suffering. Yeah. So it's not like pity, where it's like you feel bad for them but you can't do anything. It's realizing that like, oh, like I've made a difference. 
And there's some something really freeing in that moment mm-hmm. from the from the <clears throat> pathologies of self obsession. Yeah. So maybe maybe that's what I would tell people. I'm like, find a way of having direct encounters with people that you can serve. Yeah, in get some some, fundamental way. Stop focusing on your ego of what you don't have and start helping other people. Yeah. Easier said than done. Much easier said than done. Um, and, and and it's the kind of experience that I would say is 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 cannot be described. So there's mm-hmm. two forms of knowledge. There is knowledge by description and there's knowledge by acquaintance. So I could tell you, I could describe to you, I could be really poetic and mm-hmm. tell you what it feels like to be next to another human and, and, uh-huh. and, and help them out and have the compassion and the connection and the, the empathy of realizing I am because you are, like we are all one and the freedom from the self that that gives us. I could describe it, I could write yeah. a poem about it, I could approximate the experience. That's knowledge by description. But that is very different, very different than knowledge by acquaintance. Yeah. Knowledge by acquaintance would be you having the felt experience of that, yeah. like undergoing the experience for yourself. People describe psychedelics the same way. They're like, you know, you can tell a depressed person that there's a different place to plant their feet. You know, a depressed person, their lenses of perception, you know, have limited and constrained their worldview. They have a failure of the imagination. This is what Kierkegaard says. Mm. The failure of the imagination means that the, 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 the system in, by which you can imagine a different life for yourself is broken. Mm. in a depressed person. It's broken. It's like faulty mechanics. How do we, how do we expand right. our imagination? So, so listen to this. So, so you have these lenses of perception and you mistake those perceptions for reality. Right? Your brain is always filling in the blanks. You're getting limited information from the world and you're filling in the blanks like with your own lenses. Right. But listen to this. Yeah. You see with your lenses and you see through your lenses. But you know what you don't see? The lenses themselves. Therefore, if the lenses aren't serving you, but you're not aware that you have those lenses, you think what you see is reality. I'm depressed and everything is depressing and there's no Everyone's hope. out to get me. You don't see that, that, that your lenses are coloring your reality. But, so therefore, knowledge by description won't help these people. Mm-hmm. Like you can tell them about all the ways their life can be better. They can't hear it. The fucking lenses won't let it in. But there's experiences that are knowledge by acquaintance. Mm-hmm. Take that depressed person, tie them with a rope and throw them over a bridge and a bungee jump thing. Or, Fly them on a plane and put them in an African village where they can be volunteers, you know, like, or give them a psychedelic experience. Yeah. You know what that does? It smacks them over the face with the felt experience. Mm-hmm. That becomes knowledge by acquaintance. Yeah. And that is undeniable because it shows them another place to plant their feet. Yeah. And what that does is it makes the possessor of a lens of perception aware that they have a lens of perception because once you physically make them stand over here, metaphorically and physically, now they can see where they were standing before. Yeah. But until you pick them up and put them in that other place, there was no way. You could tell them a million descriptions and reasons why there's another place from which to plant their feet, not until they physically are planting there. So you become aware mm-hmm. that you're a possessor of the lens of perception. And then you can go whoosh, 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 dispense lens, those yeah. lenses of perception. And that, I think, is the future of mental yeah. health. And that is how we fucking heal our fractures. It's true. I think Tony Robbins says something around the lines of, Trade your expectations for appreciation and you'll live a completely different life. It's, you know, change the lens, but also see like someone who has less off than you. You know, go experience something. Maybe you're being in service to someone who has less off than you or someone who's experienced a different, more challenging life than Mm -hmm. you. And you can start to say, oh, I don't have it as bad as this person Mm -hmm. or this community or this culture or these, you know, this country. Like, well, all the things to be grateful for. Yeah. It's a simple exercise. Gratitude and appreciation yeah. is so simple, and maybe yeah. it's like too dumbed down. I don't mm-hmm. know, but mm-hmm. no, no, it's not. Every time I focus on what I'm grateful for and I'm, mm-hmm. when I'm appreciative, it's like my ego starts to fade away. Yeah. I start to tap into a, a deeper sense of pure love as opposed yeah. to anxiety and yeah. scarcity, yeah. and this sense of abundance yeah. pours through my soul. It's like a golden light is just exuding through my pores. Yeah. yeah. And you stop thinking about the ego and what you're lacking. You That's start right. focusing on what you have and appreciate it. That's right. But then the, the part that I think can be tricky for that is that if people have had, especially material success, mm-hmm. they've built a bubble around themselves. Yep. And they're living a siloed existence where their social media is like reinforcing their own belief systems uh-huh. and feeding their comparison and their FOMO with other people. 
Um, they're <laughs> hanging out with people that are too like-minded, that maybe are not challenging them, or that are reinforcing certain thought patterns and so on and so forth, that then you can tell yourself to be more appreciative until you go to lunch with your friend and he's saying, so man, you know, how's your growth this month? Yeah, or right. how's the thing? You know, I mean, we all get caught up in those trappings. Comparison is so the thief like, of joy, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that Einstein? I think Einstein said comparison is the thief of joy. That's cool. It's like if you're always comparing to your friend circle or your family circle or to the social media followers, uh, uh, people you follow and you're always like, well, Jason got 30 million views on this video. I only got 10 million. I freaking suck this week. That's right. That's like right. you can compare oh, yeah. all day long and it'll rob you of joy. Oh, 100%. And the Buddha said, do not compare yourself to others for you will become vain and bitter. That's true. And by How the do way, we stop by comparing the way, ourselves? Even, even a self-proclaimed enlightened being Compares. can be caught up in that. I have, I have had moments where I have felt like I have tasted a vision of, 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 of such sort of inspiring proportions that I feel like, oh wow, this is, must be what enlightenment feels like. I know that sounds really arrogant, and then? but I know how, <laughs> how wrong I was <laughs> um, when I find myself thinking, oh man, like, am I having as much of success? You know, and look at what these other people are doing and am I focusing enough? And then it's like how quickly you can throw yourself off your own fucking pedestal. Yeah. Um, but then the problem is not, <laughs> that's the thing is you don't want either extreme. You don't want to put yourself on a pedestal that's too high where your self-love makes you blind to the <laughs> suffering of others. But then you also don't want to compare yourself to others and throw yourself under the like, bus I to suck, think that I'm you're horrible. like a worthless piece of shit. You yeah. Know? And so it's all comes like, back to like chaos yeah, and order yeah, in, the, yeah, in, the dude, middle. in the middle. But how do we stop comparing ourselves when social media is in our faces every day, when our friends are always talking about the great things they're up to, when yeah. We want you know, to grow and expand ourselves, yeah. but then everyone else is expanding quicker than me. Mm -hmm. How do we stop judging and, and comparing and, well, and you bring tend more to, you, fulfillment? You, you tend to only really compare yourself to people who are similar enough to you that their success somehow means your lack. Uh, you know, you don't tend to yourself, I'm sure you don't compare yourself to world champ, champion gymnasts. No, like LeBron you know James I mean? or something. Yeah, or like anything. you don't really like compare yourself with him because it's not like, it's not like that's close enough to what you do to feel that his success is somehow threatening to you. You might compare people. It comes people, from a scarcity mindset. Yeah. Well, you might compare yourself to other people who do video podcasts and who have right. thought leaders on their show. Right. And you might What are friends somehow, you grew up with or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, also family. <laughs> and you might think that their success somehow minimizes your success. Or that, they're better that, than that, you. That, that the 10 million people that watched them somehow made the two million people that watched your episode count less. Yeah. Whereas if you actually encounter one of those people on the street, you'll see that just touching one person is enough to make your day better. Huge game one, changer. One person. One person. One person is enough. To you make should be making better. work to impact one person, That's right. not to be like, well, right. I need to change the That's world. Right. That's right. If that happens, That's great. Right. That happens a lot to actors, dude. Like movie stars, you know, you see these movie stars, and you're like, oh man, they're so cool, they're so famous, they make such beautiful they're miserable. art, they're celebrated around the world because they're comparing yourself to the younger, hotter, newer actor. Yeah, I'm a has been. I'm the Brad Dude. Pitt's forty something, yeah. whatever, fifty now. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. I'm not this like young guy anymore. Dude, I've seen interviews. I think it was with Ethan Hawke, who I adore. I think he's wonderful. He's done so many amazing films, and he was talking. He was talking about how he he was done a movie and he's getting the best reviews of his career and how does it feel and he was very honest he was like oh you can have 99 amazing reviews but then there's like that one review that is bad and you're like ah oh, they saw through my performance They're, they know <laughs> you know um so again it can play with us both ways right one person that tells us something nice can make your day but one person that tells us something negative can ruin our day ruin your year we, we're, if you we're focus so, on it Human beings, we're so sensitive. I've always, I've always asked myself this question: is like more so now why, than ever. Why is it that a great day we're sad that it's going to end too soon, and a bad day we're sad it's never going to end? Right. <laughs> it's a great day. Our relationship with, with time, you know, with <laughs> thinking about the great day of like, oh, I wish this would last for so long, but yeah. it's going to be over soon, and like yeah. holding on to yeah. it. Yeah. But you're, like you but said, then the, the bad, bad day, day you think it's never ends. Last for, you see, you think it's going to last forever. Like, why can't we be like? Oh, the, the bad reverse. day will end very fucking quick if we yeah. just like let go of like anger, you know. Um, what do you think holds us all back the most? What's the thing that holds us back from our greatness? Fear. From fear of what? Fear of failure, fear of success, fear of the judgment of other people. Well, I think all those fears are rooted in the fear of death. And there's a theory, it's called terror management theory, 
and it, it comes from Ernest Becker's work in The Denial of Death, but these psychologists have done these studies and basically say that if you um, remind people of their mortality even subliminally, um, they tend to become more judgmental of the other, more sort of um, hostile towards people who are different than them. When you remind and, people of their mortality. Yeah, and that's why politicians, populist politicians, like the man we have in office, he uses fear to get people to hate the other. The immigrants or the this or the that. And, and it's like it's, he's, he keeps using these words like it's dangerous. They're coming after us. It's a threat because you remind people of their mortality. It makes people recoil and become like more. Again, so more people are afraid to towards the other. die, then they're going to vote in a different. Yeah, and they're not, even, they're not even thinking mortality. Just a threat, any mm -hmm. kind of threat. You know? But isn't it, the, is it yeah. the country or the culture of Bhutan? Is that what it is? Yeah. Every, five times a day, they focus on their death. They, they pray and acknowledge their death. And well, in that thought process, sure. five times it a day, sense. they make, they have it so much, sense. it's like the happiest country or culture yeah. in yeah. the world because yeah. they're always focused on like being present and being yeah. joyful of what yeah. we have because yeah. one day this will all yeah. end. Well, I guess it's, it's, they've acquiesced to that reality. It's, it's acceptance. They're, it's they're, acceptance. And they're That's not clinging. And by not clinging, they suffer less. less. And, There's an app called We Croak. Oh, God. It's called We Croak. I think it's called yeah W E Croak, like the like yeah. the frog. Yeah. And it texts me five times a day, "You're gonna die," with a quote of like being in the now. It texts you moment. five times a day. It's like a notification on my phone that comes up. That's all it does. Five times a day, it says. See how that might be. You were gonna die. I don't know if I want to sign up for that one. And now. it's you should try it for a week. It's just experiment and yeah. just allow yourself to say okay. Let me be. It allows you to say none of this is gonna matter one day. Yeah, but that would make me. So let's be joyful in the moment, let's be no, appreciate yeah, right. the moment, let's right. be grateful, let's make the most of the moment. Because this could all end tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that is helpful until it's not. Because <laughs> cause doesn't, that, doesn't that also make you more anxious? I have a very strange relationship oh. with attachment because I know that attachment brings suffering. But yes. I also know that love and passion and drive is fueled by an attachment to an idea, an attachment to a moment, an attachment yes. to a person. Like an obsession. The, the obsession, the artistic temperament is, is ruled by unruly emotions. It's being committed and unattached. It's like, how do you be committed to the dream, the desire, the outcome, but being unattached to how it happens, the mechanism for how it happens, if Maybe it happens. I'm going to give it my fucking all. That's it. it work out, I don't give a shit. That's it. And that's what I've... Come, it's more about the journey, you know, it's, it's, it's loving the process of trying to get there. Whether it happens or not is actually irrelevant. Yeah. If you fail at not making the dream happen, mm. but you learn about the beauty of life in mm. that 10 year span mm. or five year span of mm -hmm. trying to create it, mm -hmm. that's a success in itself. Yeah. That type of theory. So wait, the terror management theory, it goes back to what again now? If you remind people of their mortality, even subliminally, they will be much more hostile towards other groups and people wow. who are different than them. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very scary because it shows us that there's a relationship with our mortality that goes that's underneath our, our self awareness and our self consciousness. That's just this like reptilian brain thing, and mm -hmm. and it can be exploited by wow. politicians. And, and that's and it can be exploited by social media. You perpetuate fear. Fake you, news. People's yeah. amygdalas get activated, and you can create vitriol, and you can create hatred, and you can close the ego to be more, more like hyper vigilant. You know. Well, you said the fear of death was what you were talking about here. The, yeah. And that's the thing that <clears throat> holds us back the most is having this fear of death. Well, I think just just letting fear paralyze us and keep us from doing what we must do. Like I, I did a video recently about the utility or the healing power of death practices. Mm, and of and like putting yourself in the grave. Having having psychological death experiences. So yeah. I'm not I'm not saying to people for people to kill themselves. I think suicide is tragic. Um, but I'm talking about experiences of psychological death. Like uh, voluntary killings of the ego which is very mm -hmm. different from involuntary killing of the ego. Involuntary killing of the ego is somebody stabs you in the back when you weren't looking, like your love of your yeah, life betrays yeah. you by cheating on you or something. Like that's, that's got to hurt. But voluntary submission, voluntary killing of the ego might be, I'm going to jump off a plane. 
I'm going to go skydiving. Bungee jumping. Yeah, yeah bungee yeah. jumping. I'm going to sit in Peru and, and drink some magic mushrooms, and I'm going to die to my old self so that something new can be born. Um, that's why the MDMA psychotherapies are very effective as well. It seems to me that these contained and compressed psychological experiences that allow us to put ourselves to the side to die to who we were, mm -hmm. you know, we must let go of the life we've planned so that we can lead the life that is waiting for us, said Joseph Campbell. Right. And it's, I feel like that is definitely true. For me, it has been true temporarily. So I have found cures to my distress, at least for weeks at a time, through these psychological death practices. Now, I've used Mostly cannabis has been mm -hmm. my, my medicine yeah, yeah. for that, which is a plant medicine that's now legal in California. It's been used for thousands of years in ceremonial contexts. I find that in, that in the right container, cont um, um, cannabis can allow you to inhabit a space outside your normal, narrow-minded, focused, and self-obsession space. And, and, and there can be something really therapeutic about planting your feet in a different space and a different modality of perception, seeing the world through a different lens. All of that is very healing because... Um, it, it, it is a kind of death practice. It's a death to your ego, at least yeah. a little bit. It's a death to your neurosis. It's a death to whatever you were obsessed with or thinking about a few hours ago. Any experience of letting go is going to be ultimately healing. So maybe we could design, you know, we're in the experience economy after all. You know, maybe we should encourage our friends at Summit Series to design, yeah. um, to integrate into their into their summits um, these kinds of well-prepared death practice stunts, you know, um, where people can... I remember even in high school, I went on this survival and leadership workshop, and one of the things that they used to do was blindfold us and have like somebody else like guide us like through the forest and like have to like get us trust back to surrender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or like even trust falls. You yeah, know? And, and all those kinds of experiments that that allow us to face our fears. I mean, it sounds cliche, but it makes a lot of sense. Maybe we can get more creative with it. Maybe virtual reality, actually. Yeah. You're doing stuff on virtual reality too. You know, I, I've played with it. I've done some videos on it, but I definitely think that that you know, I was listening to this this doctor actually. Well, he works for a hospital, but he's in their VR department, and he was saying that VR is like the new syringe. You know, it gives us direct access to the mind. And so, what are we? What medicine are we going to put in that syringe? And could it be like an exercise where you put on the thing, and, and in the in the VR you jump off a building, mm. or in the VR you experience something like really profound? You know. Ugh. Not to bring an old technology as an example, but one of my favorite tools or, or machines for experiencing empathy, which is also a death of the self a little bit. You know, it's funny because as soon as you care about somebody else, you cease to exist and you cease to matter. And the other person's welfare becomes your welfare yeah. and the sense of self expands. Cinema was once called the machine for empathy because it shows you what it's like to be another person, to step into another person's shoes, right? To assume the viewpoint of another. <sighs> have freedom from oneself mm. now a lot of movies today are really cheesy and tacky sure, but sure. like cinema as an art form or as a way of sculpting in time what really was an opportunity to step into someone else's shoes and if we would use it in that way uh, more I think that's something else that we could sort of religiously put into our daily death practice or yeah. our weekly death practice like what film am I gonna see today maybe in the future we combine these cinemas and we, we, we treat them more like temples or churches. Maybe you arrive to the cinema and they have incense yeah. and you have to take your shoes off and you have to like do, you know, put a little like, little make a little offering to the poster <laughs> to like Christopher Nolan or Steven Spielberg. Right. <laughs> and then and then maybe they have like little cannabis vape pens because it's kind of that, that makes you more open and more suggestible. It makes you more susceptible to the hypnotic trance of the film. So you have a little cannabis and you know they take away your cell phone, you leave them in the locker so that you don't even have the opportunity to turn it on during the movie. And then you go on and the films have been selected by a curated group of academics, philosophers <laughs> and thinkers and cinema as therapy. Cinema interesting. As I mean, I right. certainly know that with that kind of presentation and setup and even having the cannabis, the context, the everything set up like ritualistically and ceremoniously, I feel like a film like Inception, a film like Interstellar, oh a gosh. film like The Fountain, you know, these films could be literally like soul medicine. It's true. I mean, holy shit. <laughs> um, wow. Maybe that, that maybe we should do that. We should like organize this. And a ritual cinema, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm curious about um, 
what it's like being in a relationship with you, a committed, intimate relationship. And I'm a lover, man. <laughs> you're a lover. I am. How do you find joy staying in a committed relationship when novelty wears off? When you're talking oh, earlier about how novelty one. is the good thing one. that brings us good joy good and question. like interesting, but when the wonder is no longer there, it's probably been a question for hundreds of years with, yeah, with people of like, for sure. When the wonder of the newness of the experience of the magical love in the first mm -hmm. year, two years, whatever yeah. it is, when it starts to fade because yeah. you're in the same routine. That's right. How do you? Well, I think I think it, it, it helps to have an understanding of your own neurochemistry. So there is like, something there is something called hedonic adaptation, which simply means the best chocolate cake you've ever had in your life. If you have it every day for a week, by the seventh tired. day, it, it literally tastes like shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, but. If you have it once every other week, it'll taste delicious every time you have it. But when you're next to someone every day. Well, but maybe we need to call into question the way we arrange our romantic relationships. Um, maybe you guys each keep your own apartment instead of buying a home together. Mm. Maybe you see each other four times a week and you take solo time for the other days so you can think about each other and miss each other. Maybe you take you decide that when you get together, you're gonna to spend a year traveling around the world. And every month, the new backdrop spikes your dopamine and makes the familiar person become strange again. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do rituals and sacraments and ceremonies together that heighten your perceptions, that make you see them more clearly. Um, Blake was the poet who wrote that famous line that I think I've repeated in every one of my videos, but it's something I aspire to. You know, It's like, this is what I want in my in my bumper sticker, every in my car, you know, like to see the world in a grain of sand, to see heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of our hands, to hold eternity in an hour. Like if we could do that, we'd be gods. Mm. We'd be gods, you know. And, and 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 maybe that's enlightenment, you know, is to see the infinity in every moment, in every person, to see the mystery in a person that's been lying next to you for three to four years. Um, but I think, I think having an awareness of how our minds work, an awareness of how spaces, contexts, situations trigger us, an awareness of our relationship with habit, with routine, and then just design for more fulfillment. I actually think it, it's, we're talking ultimately about a design challenge, mm -hmm. everything. Can we design for fulfillment? Can we design for happiness? Can we design for purpose? Can we design for passion? You know, architects understand the cognitive impact of built environments. You know, like it's a big thing, man. There was this article in New York Magazine called The Psychological Impact of Boring Buildings. And it was saying how like certain buildings design in certain utilitarian ways rather than in ways that are conducive to creative flourishing. Yeah. yeah, too much engineering, not enough psychology, you know all about efficiency and nothing has to do with human yeah, yeah. Um, can actually make people depressed can wow. make people like all this can have all people can have all these psychological um, negative effects based on the built environments that surround them but the opposite is also true you can design for human flourishing you can design for human creativity yeah um, and so I think it's it's you know city planners could could design for that. I know that in aviation, the, the Dreamliner aircraft was the first aircraft, aircraft interior design in combination with psychologists to make it feel more airy, to make it feel more comfortable, to space the seats in a way that is like just outside of making it feel claustrophobic. Yeah. Um, but this is a huge thing because everything we design in the world, and this is an insidious but also amazing thing, is designing us right back. And we don't normally think of that circular relationship. You know, we think of like, oh, I'm going to design my room. It's going to look cool. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to design my, pimp out my car. It's going to look cool. I'm going to design my dream house. But what are you, I mean, it's like feedback loop. Mm. What are you actually doing? No, what you're designing is the way that is going to design you right back. What you design has then a script. And then that script is broadcasted in your direction whenever you're inside that dwelling or that mm -hmm. design. This chair is designing my comfort level, which is informing the thoughts that naturally emerge in this conversation. Right. If this chair was like leaning forward and I it was like uncomfortable <laughs> backrest, I wouldn't be as loose. Right. You know, all those things are affecting us. And so maybe what we need to do is deploy, you know, architects and psychologists mm. and designers to work together to think of the design of the world as the design of the mind. 
-hmm. And so we could design for better minds. Yeah. And maybe that's going to be like our next stage of development. Wow, man. That's fascinating. So yeah. how are you designing your relationship to make sure it flourishes. Like we, it's we a rainforest, a yeah, not yeah, a yeah. desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we've had the opportunity to do some traveling. I think one of my, one of my little shortcut hack situations was when I really, my, when a speaking career took off um, in the middle of brain games, and the opportunity to travel the world and, and talk to audiences, um, which was like, hey, feeling of purpose, feeling of inspiring people, feeling of impact. Um, but then also having a business model that took me to different places, uh -huh. and then I could just stay longer. Yeah. I'm never gonna like fly somewhere for a day and fly home. No, you're like, like a week or two. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> if I have a speech in Cancun. I'm going to Tulum. Yeah, you know, I have a speech in Iceland coming up in May. Oh, and I have awesome. a speech in Brazil in June, and so <laughs> it's like bring it on. And and so I've taken I'm taking my girl on some of these journeys, and I'm like, if not now when if not us who like right. let's do this you know i also think it bonds you together the mm. more strange the landscape that surrounds you the more it pushes you into this like intersubjective space where you're having a common experience right it's like the two of you shared are next to each other but it's yeah. a shared experience man and so it expands the narrative of us and that's a very powerful thing so i try i'm trying and that to deepens the relationship yeah. it bonds the experience thousand percent <sighs> yeah bro what's the question you think you'll never get answered You know, I struggle with the whole concept of faith and belief. Huh. Um, I came across this line recently that I really responded to. It said, collect ideas, not beliefs. If you collect ideas, right, it means that you're like, oh, that's interesting, and then that's interesting, and then this is interesting, and then that's also interesting. And some of these contradict each other, but it's okay. Because I don't have to believe any of them. I can just entertain their feasibility and find them interesting. So I can collect all these different ideas. The problem with beliefs is that when you collect one belief, You're stuck. you well, you knock offline any belief that contradicts that particular belief. And so if you get too stuck with your beliefs, you narrow your worldview. And you also narrow your critical thinking. Because You're more you judgmental. Have, you have the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You become very judgmental. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. And so, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. It's just it is what it is. Yeah. And that's so. So when you ask yeah. me what question I think I'll never be able to answer, I was going to say even though I struggle with beliefs precisely because I want to collect ideas, one belief that I desperately cling to is that all questions will be answered. That I <laughs> like I, I I I'm like stubborn that way, and I'm like no no I will find, everything will be found out in due time. You mean? Like I will live to know everything. Like I want, I want to pinwheel in deep time. I want to like witness a celestial event in the cosmos. I want to be able to ride on a starship one day. Like I'm just, wow. I'm, just I'm clinging to the possibility that all my sci-fi wet dreams will, will come, come true. true. Who do you think was the smartest person ever to live that had the, the best knowledge of most answers or most questions that they answered them somehow? Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell, uh, he wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Mm -hmm. He's the guy behind the monomyth uh, idea that every story tells the same story. Um, I think the, uh, the wisdom there is seeing a, a brilliant understanding of the difference between literal truth and metaphorical truth, between objective facts and poetic facts. Uh, Werner Herzog famously said, um, if all you want is facts, buy the phone book. Right. It's full of facts. You know, Lewis Howes, 974-7542, Jason Silva, 972-7045, you know, full of facts. But it doesn't illuminate. And it's important not for people not to confuse what I'm saying. I'm not saying that facts aren't important. I don't, I don't support the weaponization of fake yeah, news yeah. on social media. Like, we need objective scientific facts and consensus and architecture and physics and design to build things that work. We have to agree when the light is green, when the light is red, the world is round, and so on and so forth. But... When it comes to interior experience, when it comes to subjective experience, when it comes to what it's like to be a person, that's very hard to describe from the inside, right? Description from the outside is easy. You're a human being, your heart beats at this many beats per second, you have a nervous system, you have a brain, you might have a chemical imbalance or not have a chemical imbalance. These are all objective facts that describe accurately from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. Science describes accurately from the outside. 
poetry describes accurately from the inside. So when I speak of poetic facts, mm -hmm. or when I speak of ecstatic truth, I speak about the truth of mythology. I speak about the truth that Joseph Campbell and Jordan Peterson talks about. I speak uh -huh. about the truth of an artistic rendering. I speak about the truth of the way a poem describes the smell of a flower. I speak about the truth yeah. of the anguish and the agony of love that only a Beethoven melody can appropriately convey. You know, sometimes art is the lie that reveals the truth. Sometimes fiction is more truthful than reality. And that's... You know, and Joseph Campbell is very good at, at understanding that, and, and so is and so is Jordan Peterson. I remember he yeah. was he was talking with Sam Harris, and he was talking about uh, astrology, and, and and Sam Harris, of course, was was dissing astrology. And I love Sam Harris; he's a friend. And and what he was saying is astrology is not scientific. Like, duh, it's like superstition, and it doesn't doesn't help us in any way. And Jordan Peterson's answer was very interesting. He was saying, you know, that may well be true that that astrology is a fiction compared to astronomy. But he basically said that astrology was astronomy in its earlier form. And that what we did with astrology was drape the cosmos with our consciousness. Mm. We looked up and we projected our minds onto that canvas. Yeah. And that North Star guided early sailors across the oceans. And they might as well be spacefaring explorers yeah. going into the unknown, being guided by that North Star that they might have called God. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So even though they projected their wishes, longings, and dreams into the stars through astrology, that still was the first step. It got us out of bed. It got us onto the water. It made us jump mm -hmm. you know, into the unknown. And so in that sense, it was still a healthy drive. Wow. And so to have an understanding of the, of the relationship with those, two, with those two things, like science and art, I think it's, it's just very important. And I think it can be summed up with the line that I just said, like science describes accurately from the outside and poetry describes accurately from the yeah. inside. Yeah. I think it was Ursula Le Guin who said that. And I was like, wow. <laughs> So good, man. What are you most excited about? Thank you for about? helping bring this out of Of course, me. man. This is powerful. <laughs> what are you most excited about lately? What are you working on? Um, I'm excited about learning more and more trust, right? More trust and more, with what? More and more just to practice like trust falls. So, trusting yourself, trusting other people, mm -hmm. trusting taking, the taking, universe. Taking more chances. Um, my cousin, Michael, I don't know if you see this hat I'm wearing, yeah. Flo Kana. So, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur. And he used to work at Merrill Lynch and then found that to be soulless and he quit, traveled the world for a year, went back to Venezuela, fell in love, met the love of his life, did a bunch of psychedelics, got rid of his limiting beliefs, took a Tony Robbins course, sure. read a Richard Branson book, changed his whole life, started a new business in Venezuela selling stevia, was successful for a few uh -huh. years. Venezuelan economy crashed and burned, business crashed and burned, lost it all, then moved to California to get into the cannabis space. Wow. And five years later, he is the number one flower brand in California with a half billion dollar valuation. Flo Kana, and that guy is a guy, he's my cousin that I grew up with, that guy has no fear, right? That's a guy that like, you know, I, I often make self-deprecatingly will admit I'm really good at understanding ideas, like really coming up with insights and articulating those insights, not so good at putting them into practice, <laughs> just yeah, not yeah. so good. Yeah. Whereas like my cousin, he's somebody that understands insights like that, like limiting beliefs getting out of our own way. Everything we want is on the other side of fear, taking the road less traveled by, and that will make all the difference. Like he read the Richard Branson book, he took the Tony Robbins yeah. course, and then he like went and applied it, and like four years later, he's a tycoon in the cannabis space, wow. bringing, bringing a magical medicinal medicine and herb to millions of people, and in the process, creating a company that's now valued at half a billion dollars, and so, I am inspired by his capacity to maybe feel the fear and do it anyway. And I want to lean more into that, that in my own yeah. life. Um, there are a lot of things that I have overcome, you know, stage fright being one of them. I'm timid and I'm in, uh, introverted and I get up on stage in front of thousands of people. Um, so there's definitely like, I, I, I have overcome a lot of my fears kicking and screaming. I would like to overcome the rest of my fears with equanimity mm. and a kind of stoicism. What's the biggest fear that you have yet to overcome that you want to, if you could overcome it this year, it would be a huge victory. Um, so two of them. One of them, 
I, I, I've, I've had a lot of financial success, but I still live with an ad- attitude of scarcity. Oh, interesting. So I am like a Jewish grandma, like my Jewish grandma, <laughs> who I love very much, but she grew up in the Depression. Yeah. And so even though my grandfather was very successful in Venezuela and she had a marvelous life of abundance, she was always like, like she had like the hyper vigilance of scarcity, oh, like every penny, like worried about it. And so you're always like worried. You're always worried, you know, and I, I kind of want to just like trust, like, look, all the great things in my life have not happened when I was looking for them. All the great things in my life, all the success in my life mm-hmm. always happened when I was in my zone, doing my art, doing my thing and the right thing showed up. And all I did was seize it when it was there. And when I get stuck thinking, planning, what's worrying about what's the next thing, I'm out of my flow. And it's when literally I'm not thinking about it and I'm just trusting that the thing has showed up and then I've seized it. So I want to try to like, feel, like infuse that attitude into, into how I feel about like, you know, financial stuff and this and that. Just like stop worrying, you know, like just look at the facts. The yeah. facts are everything has been great. And so just yeah. not live from a place of scarcity. Be more like my cousin in that sense. And then the other thing I would like to get over is um, I'm a bit of a... I just, I, I'm a bit of like a, kind of like a hypochondriac, like I just, you know, I'm very healthy, but I'm always like worried, like, oh, what happens if this person gets sick, or what happens if that person gets that, you know, yeah. uh, you know I, I just wanted to just like have a little more like trust, I'm like, look, I take care of myself, I've always been healthy, and I just like assume the best, and not, not lose sleep over worrying about mm. what if scenarios in the future, you know, yeah. those are two th- if I could let go of those two things, and just like trust the abundance is coming, and trust in like, you know, good health, and, and, and good vibes, I think I'll be a much happier, much happier person. Less you know? stressed out. And be able to take more chances without mm-hmm. losing sleep over it, over that, yeah. you know. How can I support with that? Text you every few months and just check in on yeah. you, make sure you're, okay. Yeah, 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 to so be like, hey bro, are you, are you doing it? Are you leaning into the you discomfort? Conquer your fears, yes. Yeah, I went to Burning Man this year. That was the first huge. time? First time, have you been? I've never been. I haven't been called. Okay. And I feel like you gotta be called. 1-800-Lewis House. <laughs> called for to called, do it. I'm calling you right now. I don't ring, feel ring, called. ring, 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 ring. <laughs> I'm sure that, be a, that a is magical a, That is an experience. There. I avoided it for seven years. Yeah. And my fear was like, I won't be able to sleep with the bomb, 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 bomb of the, of the rave. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. I was able to sleep, but I'll tell you, it's not really even about the parties. It's about witnessing what is created from scratch in a couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah. Witnessing the a level art. of art and the level of, 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 of creativity mm-hmm. that is like multiple slaps in the face. Um, probably the most profound element, aside from riding your bicycle in a playground for a week and a half and seeing so much art, is the temple. So the temple is a non-denominational temple where people can come to grieve and to burn their grief. Wow. So it's full of sort of photos, handwritten letters, uh, images of people that who have lost people wow. close to them. So people that have died, like people's kids or people's grandparents wow. or ex-girlfriends or somebody that from an illness. And so when you walk there, not only are people in their whacked out costumes, you know, at all hours of the day, but they're crying. People are crying. Some people are crying alone. Some people are crying in groups. Strangers are hugging and crying. So it's this communal place of grief. Wow. And, and grief is so cathartic, you know? We, we avoid it like the plague, but man, there's few things that feel as good as a good cry. Yeah. Especially when you actually allow yourself to cry in the presence of strangers and you realize that they're actually kind. And so the feeling of communion and shared grief, which tells us again, we don't know how we got here. We don't know why we're here. And we don't know where we're going. We're like a fucking moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam, in the words of Carl Sagan. But he said we are also a way for the cosmos to know itself. And so, you know, let's be brothers and sisters in light. Let's hold hands. Let's cry naked here in the desert, you know, and let's say that will mm. be there for one another mm. and that will have to be enough for now. Wow. And, 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 and that alone was worth the price of, of admission. So I, I think you would actually love it. I'm sure. I think you would love it too. You have a heart this big, so yeah, I yeah. have no doubt. I'm sure I would. Will, that you will love it. Just the commuting up there, the dirty desert, the <laughs> it's not as bad as you just think. Get just, nice just, 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 yeah. just get a nice RV. Just get a really nice RV. Just get a really nice situation. You know, like some people go and they go for like two grand. You know, you have to spend like ten grand. Yeah, to feel um, like just get a really nice there. RV, and you could even 
pay somebody to drive it in for you. Right, and just Although show the up. drive from Lake Tahoe is not bad, man. Four or five hours. Yeah. Two friends you really love. Um, get a meal plan from one of the camps so that you mm. don't have to cook. There you go. And just be okay. fed and enjoy my but life. Then, yeah. Electric bikes. Yeah. And you will, you will dominate the experience. Will. <laughs> just, just, just. Um, this is called The Three Truths. I think I asked you last time, but in case you forgot, uh, imagine this is your last day. Yeah. As many years as away as you want it to be, you yeah. can extend your life as far sure, as you can go, sure. but in one day you've got to turn off the lights. Sure, sure, sure. And you've accomplished everything you want. Yeah. You've lived the dream life. Mm -hmm. You've got the relationships, the experiences, the success, everything. Mm -hmm. But it's the last day and you've got to take everything with you. Everything you've created, your ideas, your thoughts, your work of art has, has to go with you. Mm -hmm. And you get to leave behind a piece of paper or something etched in stone that says my three truths. Mm. The three things you know to be true about mm. all your experiences in life that mm. you would then give as your commandments to the Whoa. world. Whoa. This is all that they would have to be reminded of your lessons. Yeah. yeah. Jason Silva's three truths. What would you say? <sighs> First one would be Nietzsche. Say those who were seen dancing were called insane by those who could not hear the music. That would be the first one. First what does truth. that mean? Um, it means don't be afraid to be yourself. March to the beat of your own drummer. Mm -hmm. Carve your own path. Take the journey. Be willing to be ridiculed. Mm -hmm. The whole thing. Like okay. Those who were seen dancing were called insane by those who could not hear the music. Interesting. Okay, number one. Um, number two. Number two. Number two. The only people for me are the mad ones. Mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. Those who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, 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 like yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. And that, I think it's Jack Kerouac, but that quote is about um, celebrating you're crazy, celebrating your, your weird, celebrating your unique dance and way of being. Do not compare yourself to others, for you will become vain and bitter. Embrace your contradictions, you know. Be mad to live, mm -hmm. be mad to talk, be mad to be saved, you know. Want it all at the same time. Sure, you know? sure. Like just, just, it's a celebration, I think, of that beautiful passion that characterizes the human condition. And, 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 and it does come with a lot of suffering, but it is through overcoming that suffering that we might become whole. Yeah. So that would be number two. And then number three, hmm. Oh yeah, Flaubert. Human speech is but a cracked kettle on which we tap crude rhythms while we long to make music that will melt the stars. And of course, what that means is we may be crude, we may be fumbling, stumbling monkeys, you know, doing our best, you know, like trying to like render beauty in the world. And granted, we've, we've done pretty good, man. Look at our Gothic cathedrals <laughs> and our beautiful music. I mean, but in the end, like, even when we talk, like it's still crude. In, in terms of what we what we yearn to express with our crude tools, which is to make music that will melt the stars. Mm. Um, and there was an article recently in Nautilus magazine that was saying that some of the some of the um, I guess chemicals in our DNA uh, were first forged in stars, and so we are mm. made of stars, like literally. And and so of course it makes sense that we want we were made by those stars and we want to return the favor yeah. and make those stars like weep and melt <laughs> with our beauty. That's cool. So that's, I like those, man. that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's great, man. Well, I want to acknowledge you, Jason, for your childlike curiosity. Thanks, bro. Because every time I'm around you and every time I watch a video of yours, I feel this sense of curiosity mm. and desire mm. for reason and answers, mm. but also creating a sense of certainty and peace in people's hearts. I think a lot of people are suffering, especially in the first worlds, you yeah. know, yeah. in our world, yeah. here in our country, it's like, we may seem like we have it all, but we're suffering inside more than everyone else is. Yeah. Yeah. And you bring a sense of peace and love to people's hearts that are desperately needing it through your mm. art mm. and through your childlike mm. wonder. So mm. I acknowledge you for consistently showing up, man, over the years and, and putting your art into the world 
and having that curious drive to, to help others heal. So thank you for that, man. Well, I want to I wanna acknowledge you, man. I mean, talk about showing up every day, man, bringing another inspiring individual mm. and letting them shine. Yeah. You know, it takes, it takes a man takes a real man to bring in, you know, you talk about like we were talking about before of like not comparing yourself to others and avoiding the trappings of, of, of FOMO and like the way other people have done it. And, and yet you, you actually have created a stage to celebrate yeah. everyone else that's doing their thing. And in doing so, you become the celebrated one in turn right. because you providing this stage to mirror, reflect and, and, and put a light on so many wonderful mm -hmm. people. Yeah. It takes a real man, I think, to do that to celebrate the victories of others and right. to inquire and engage with said victories. It's, it feels so honest and so authentic and so real and so true. And I can feel your heart, man. I can always Thank feel you, your heart in, in all your, in all your content. You know, it's, it's, I think what shines through is just the earnestness, the inquisitiveness yeah. and the realness of who you are. It's like, Oh yeah, that guy's got a big heart. Yeah. And, it, and I think it's very helpful that you're also just like a man's man, like you're a real alpha. And it's good for like other alphas that are like spending all their time, like maybe like being told that they have to like punch people in the face <laughs> and be that they see like such an alpha yeah, like yeah. you who's got like a heart of gold and is like a sweetheart, you know what I mean? Yeah, like that's, just a that's, big that's, teddy bear, you know? Yeah, yeah, dude, like that's that's beautiful. Yeah, man. thank so you, Thanks man. for what you do. Appreciate man. it, bro, yeah, appreciate of course. it. Final question is what's your definition of greatness? Definition of greatness, oh my God. <laughs> Definition of greatness. Mm. Mm. I think what makes us great at our best is the refusal to cower down in despair, mm. right? To experience the terror, the doubt, the fear, the fatalism, the resignation, the disquiet, the agitation. And with all of that, still get up and make something happen, right? It's not easy being a human being, dude. It's not easy being gifted with the self-consciousness that we are gifted. It's not easy to conceive that everything you love and everyone you love will be taken away from you in time and to still make a contribution and to still be willing to contribute and to do something worthwhile in the world, there's nothing greater than that. Mm -hmm. Jason, thanks brother, appreciate it. Thank you. Good start and finish right there, I like that. <laughs> thanks brother. <laughs>